Good afternoon, King of the Nations. Pastor Greg Zetz is here, and I bless you in the name of the Lord. Melanie, I thank you for your team and for your ministry to the heart of God, and I thank you for the grace that's on your life to do so. And Debbie, the great announcement about the Through the Bible class starting next Wednesday, the summer edition. And I just want to say we're going to be doing an overview of the book of Matthew. And, uh, you know, Matthew is a discipleship manual. It's about the nations. It's about being equipped to go to the nations. And I just want to encourage you as a church to begin reading the book of Matthew and join us at 7 o'clock on Zoom on Wednesday night. We have a good time doing this through the Bible class. As I was praying, uh, the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart and said, many of my sons and daughters are in a cloud of turbulence. And and I've made many flights around the world, and I remember one such flight, I think it was going to Mexico, and we were entering into a storm, and it was was rocking the plane. And the pilot said, we're just going to go a little higher, just hold on. Remain seated. We're just going to go a little higher and we're going to get out of this storm. And some of us today, the Holy Spirit wants to just take you a little higher. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And we don't have to submit to the turbulence and the narrative that's in that turbulence and the warfare. No, no, no. The Father wants to take you a little higher. And all you have to do is submit to the Holy Spirit and He'll take you into a place of rest and a place of peace. Amen. Next week, we are. I'm starting a series called A Racism, and I am going to address the serious uh, subject, this serious subject of racism from the Word of God, probably be a three or four part series, and I want you to join me because we need to talk and be straightforward about this plague that's in our nation and in the nations of the world, and we need to create uh, a place at King of the Nations where people can be real with their pain. And say, this is what I went through, Pastor. This is what I've experienced. This is what's happened to me. I want this place to be a safe pasture for people to receive healing and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about it very directly. So I need your prayers for that starting next Sunday morning. But today, today, we have Juan Carlos Santos, our director of Ascend Ministry. He's going to be sharing the word and finishing up the series on the indestructible church And I want you to welcome him. I want you to hear what the Holy Spirit is going to say through him. I believe in a team dynamic, and it's very important that we release the team to preach the gospel and teach the word of God. It's not just about Pastor Greg. It's about a team. And so this guy is part of this team. I love you, brother. How you doing? I'm doing good. Are you ready? Yes, yes. Thank you. It's a good day. It's a great day. Amen. Amen. You got five minutes. All right. I can do it. I just need three. (laughs) Blessings to you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, church. Um, It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here before you, um, that you allowed me to be in your home, to be on your TV, to be on your phone. Um, I am so excited for this series that we're in called The Indestructible Church. It's it's, it's been a narrative and a a series about who we are in Christ and who we have been created to be. And what The Indestructible Church is, is believers who have not allowed and will not allow hell to take away their purpose, who will not allow death to steal away their identity. God has made the church indestructible for the very reason that he wants heaven to invade earth and doing it through us, the church, the body of Christ. And you are part of the plan. I know right now you may be in your sweats, you may have only one sock on and still a little crust, but God is calling you to use you, to speak through you, so that you could be a light to this dark world. And so I just want to take a moment and pray and just invite the Holy Spirit, invite the spirit of revelation and wisdom to come into our homes. Would you join me? Father, I just thank you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the revelation of your son and the empowerment of your Holy Spirit in our lives and in the lives of of the church. I pray that today, Lord, you would bring conviction, understanding, and wisdom so that we could live a lifestyle uh, with everything you have embodied it to be. Lord, we just thank you. Amen. So today we're going to talk about the ecclesia, the church. 
I'm going to use and I'm going to reference the church as the ecclesia because I believe that somewhere down the road, we mistook the church for a building and not a movement. Where we mistook the, the, the church as, as a religious formation and not the power of God defeating hell. And part of the ecclesia, what I love about it is it's a Greek term. It wasn't a Hebrew or Israelite term. It was, it was a term that Jesus brought into the perspective uh, that was new. And what it was was it was these people would come together. They were chosen. They were chosen as part of the government. And they would come and they would gather, and when they would gather, uh, the branch of government they were was legislative. And legislative means, because I Googled it, means that they make laws. They, they enforce wars. And what I love is that the ecclesia would come together um, and decide what was good and what wasn't. And that's a powerful role. Because another thing was that you couldn't be the ecclesia individually. You couldn't be the ecclesia by yourself. In my, in my ignorance as I was younger, I used to say, well, I am the church. I don't got to go to that church because I am the church. And, and the word of God confronted me because, because the very meaning of ecclesia means a gathering. Where, where if, if Carlos was just Carlos, he couldn't be the church. But when Carlos comes with Enzo, when Carlos comes with Pastor Greg, when Carlos comes with, with Katie and we come together under the foundation of Jesus, then we become the ecclesia. Then we become the legislative power of God on earth. So I want to take you through scripture and I want us to, to redefine what it is we do when we gather and why it's important and, and, and the function that we're supposed to live out of and it's not fear, beloved. And what I, I just love is that, that, that we're in a time that's so dark, that's so crazy, that, that people are worried about political pressure, uh, worried about nuclear wars, worried about aliens, worried about conspiracy theories. But I love that we're found in Jesus and can go to the word of God. And while everything looks broken and while everything looks in despair, we could come to a place and know that he said he came to give life and life in abundance. So I want you to open your Bibles to Matthew 16, and I'm going to give you some context. We're going to start off in Matthew 15, uh, 16, 15. And the context I want to give you is Jesus was praying, right? He was praying, and the Lord was speaking to him, and then he decided to take his disciples, his followers, somewhere. And he took them to a place called Caesarea of Philippi. And what's interesting about this location is that this was a Gentile city. This was a place known for idol worship, specifically Baal and Pan. And the thing about these idols, these false gods, these false religions was that the way that they would appease, the way that they would glorify their gods was sacrificing their babies, was, was cutting themselves, was prostitution. And they would do these things uh, to appease their lowercase gods. And so Jesus takes his disciples to this place and begins asking them questions. It's a powerful thing to ask a question because when you ask a question, you control a conversation. And so Jesus is having this dialogue with his disciples, and he's like, hey, who do people say that I am? And they begin telling him, well, some people think you're Jeremiah. They thought you were Jeremiah because Jeremiah confronted the religious well, some people think you're Elijah because you do so many miracles like he did. Some people think you're John the Baptist because John the Baptist was a bad, bad man, but they cut off his head, and they think that, that you're him coming back for revenge. Some people just think you're a prophet. I understand that the crowd looked upon Jesus and thought he was a good man. He, was, he, was, he had some power upon his life. He had a calling upon his life. But Jesus set that stage up to then ask them, but, in, so we go to Matthew 16, 15, and it says, but you, who do you say that I am? It's an important question that still, that still resounds in our heart today because it matters who we say, who we believe that Jesus is. God cares about your perspective of him. 
So take a moment. Who is Jesus to you? Is he just another religion? Is he just uh, what you believe in in the moment until things get hard? Or is he God? He asks the question, who do you say that I am? And we go to the next verse in verse 16. Simon Peter spoke up and said, see, Peter was the spokesman of the disciples, and, a.k.a. he had a big mouth. But it, it, it worked to his benefit in this moment because there's something powerful when you have a big mouth and you proclaim Jesus. He says, he spoke up and said, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. I want, I want to paint the picture that they are literally in a hub center of idols, of false gods. So when Peter begins to tell Jesus what, who he is, is you are the living God. You are the anointed one. You are the son of God. It, it was a powerful declaration because he was saying, look, around all these other idols, around all these other false uh, idols, they do not compare to you. They are not like you because you live, you speak, you act. That's this type of declaration, beloved, brings commitment. Because if Peter truly understood that Jesus was the living God, that means that he had to follow him wherever he went. He had to believe everything he said. And what I love is, is Jesus replied in verse 17. It says, Jesus replied, you are favored. And privileged, Simon, son of Jonah, for you didn't discover this on your own. But my father in heaven has supernaturally revealed it to you. Look, Peter, Peter, you don't even understand how privileged you are right now. You don't even understand how blessed you are right now. Because he acknowledges that Peter came from a from the flesh he understands that he came from son of Jonah he came from the flesh but it wasn't his his earthly father who chose to reveal Jesus to him it was his earthly one and I love that Jesus chooses to reveal that God chooses to reveal Jesus to us he chooses he chooses to reveal that he loved the world so much so that he allowed he volunteered his son his beloved son to come and die for our sins. He chose him to take on uh, the the attire of flesh and blood, leaving behind his royalty, leaving behind his glory so that his son could be tempted as we are tempted. So his son could know the things and the struggles that we have faced but yet Jesus never sinned, but yet Jesus never fell to the pressure or succumb to, 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 to what the culture was saying. But no, Jesus came, became pure. He grew in maturity and favor with God, and he lived a righteous life, but yet he still died for our sins. He still yet chose to die a cursed death so that I could have life, so that I could have access to God. I love that God chooses to reveal his son to us, to reveal his love for us. And it was God who revealed Jesus to Peter. And out of revelation comes something incredible. Because verse 18 then goes on to say, I give you the name Peter, a stone. And this truth of who I am will be the bedrock of foundation on which I will build my church. My legislative assembly and the power of death will not be able to overpower it. When we have revelation of Jesus, we will have revelation of self. Before all of this, Peter was just another regular guy. Before this, Peter must have identified himself with someone that's broken, someone ordinary, just as we do. But, but when the revelation of Jesus manifests in his heart, Jesus looks at him and he says, hey, now you're Peter. Now you're a rock. Now you're stable. Now you have strength inside of you. And he tells him, look, because of the revelation, now I could build. You know how Jesus builds? Out of revelation. And it says that out of the revelation of who he is, he will build his church. One thing I love to say, one of the greatest revelations that takes the pressure off of my life is it says that Jesus builds the church. It says that Jesus is the one that constructs the, the, the building of the church. It's not the pastor. It's not the leader. It's not me and it's not you. It's him literally orchestrating, refining us, putting us in placements so that we could release heaven on earth. And so he goes on to say, my legislative assembly and the power of death will not be able to overpower it. 
Jesus was saying, look, I'm building something. I'm building something out of the revelation of who I am. And out of this revelation, what I build and what I construct is the church, is the ecclesia. It's the gathering of those that believe in me. And hell will not be able to prevail against it. Death will have no power over it. So let's put this in context. Jesus talking to his disciples. He takes them to a place where idol worship is renowned. And he begins to reveal his plans of establishing a heavenly government on earth of which will be the foundation of his name, of who he is. And he, he's, 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 he's literally revealing this in the midst of, of, of the backdrop of idols. And I begin to wonder, Jesus, why would you choose the bad neighborhood to begin talking about what you're establishing on earth? Because when it comes to real estate, you don't want to build something nice in a place where, where it will be attacked, in a place where it will be destroyed, it will, it will be vandalized. See, you, you, go, you go to places like Rockville to build up. But Jesus, see, the reason Jesus chose to begin to reveal what the church is is because the very DNA of the church is to reveal God to the lost. And what better place than to reveal God to the lost in a place of idol worship? See, it's, it's the DNA of the church to go to the dark places. It's the DNA of the church to, to not fear death, not fear fear itself, not fear being attacked. Because the very meaning of indestructible means you cannot be destroyed. And the meaning of destroyed means that, that, that to cease to exist because of damage or attack. Jesus knew that the church was going to get attacked. Jesus knew that we were going to, that, 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 that hell was literally going to come against us. But yet he chose to reveal that that was his plan. We are called to reveal a greater reality, beloved. I, I love being a Christian. I love being found in Jesus because what, 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 what I have come to understand is the world around me is not the end. But, but the, the world, the reality of heaven, I could literally bring down. I could literally influence. I could literally change the, the darkness and be a light. And that's what the church was called to do. They, they have legis- we have legislative power. But what we need is revelation of who Jesus is. What we need is revelation of who Jesus is and unity. Because it's only when the church can be the church is when we're unified. Is when we put down our preferences, when we put down our culture, when we put down our comfortability and decide to, 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 to stand on this foundation of Jesus is the living God. And he has called us to release heaven on earth. After, after he says... Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Uh, After he says, out of the revelation of who I am, I will build, I will build this government that's supposed to release heaven. He then gives them instructions. He continues with his discourse. Because, beloved, understand when revelation comes, it comes with instructions. God, in his wisdom, is willing to give you instructions understanding but also will 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 give you the ability to know that he wants you to do something with it it's the worst thing when when god reveals something and we sit on it and we say ooh that's good knowledge we fatten up with all this knowledge we we sit on on the things that god has said and called us to do and then wonder why the world is as it is beloved this is a beautiful time because it's so dark and in the darker it is, the more the light shines, the more that God is willing to pour out his spirit. And all we need is revelation of who he is. Matthew 16, 19, he goes on and he says, I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm to forbid on earth, which is forbidden in heaven, and to release on earth, which is released in heaven. Revelation brings instructions. The revelation was, hey, you know who I am. Now let me tell you what you could do because of it. He's he's literally saying, what are keys? Keys are access. Keys are authority. I can't go into a stranger's house unless I have a key. And I don't have a key unless I've been given access. And Jesus is literally saying, guys, I'm giving you keys. I'm giving you access so that you could see a greater reality, so you could experience a greater reality and bring it upon earth. 
I want you to, to, to gleam into heaven, to gleam into the places that I rule, and then I want you to establish it on earth. And I want you to see what heaven looks like. And if earth doesn't look like that, I need you to stop it. I need you to bind it. I need you to lock it up. I love that Jesus would trust. You know who he was talking to? He was talking to broken people. He was talking to lost people. He was talking to people that didn't have even a full revelation of who he was yet. But yet he trusts them with this command. Look, I want you to look at heaven. I want you to bring it down on earth. The disciples, when they asked him, Jesus, how do you pray? Because they knew that, that the power of Jesus' life came out of prayer, out of communication with God. And he said, pray like this. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. From the very beginning, Jesus, the, the, one of Jesus' strategies was not just to die on the cross for our sins, but to leave behind an established government to, to bring other lost people to him. The very first thing he, repent, he, he preaches is repent, for the kingdom of God is near. God used Jesus to bring heaven's government on earth and then chose his body, chose his believers, chose the church to establish it when he leaves. A picture of this, of what it looks like when we have keys, when we know how to bind and how to lose, how to open and how to close, is in Acts 2. Peter and the disciples just got filled with the Holy Ghost. And they, they start speaking in new tongues, and people begin to criticize. People begin to attack and, 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 and cause division and, and, and blaspheme. And how many know that in heaven there is no attack like that? There is no blaspheming. There is no confusion. So, so Peter gleamed into heaven and said, there is no confusion here, so I must speak to break the confusion, to bind the confusion, and bring truth. He preached about the gospel. He preached about Jesus, how he saved, how he died for our sins, to have, for us to have life. 3,000 3, people got saved. What did he do? He opened. He opened the door. He opened salvation for people to hear the gospel. After this verse where he talks about keys, where he talks about binding and loosing, where he talks about the, the, what the church will do, he then says in the next verse, he started talking about leaving. He started talking about how he had to die. In context, what it tells me is Jesus brings us revelation of who we're supposed to be, of the authority he has given us. And then he says, I'm giving you this authority because I'm leaving. Because I, I'm giving you this authority because I want you to be my mouthpiece. I want you to be my hands and feet. I want you to, to, to release my light so that others could come to me. Church, fear is not part of the DNA that God has given us. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. And it is time that we remove our preferences and come together and begin to pray and begin to look at heaven to find answers. I'm not worried about what's happening tomorrow because my word says, my scripture says, the Bible says that God has a plan from beginning to end. The Bible says that before the foundations of the earth, Jesus died for me. That blew my mind when I read it because what, what it was telling me was that, that before sin came in the world, before Adam sinned, be, before I was formed, before the world was formed, it says that Jesus already died for me. So before there was a problem, God already brought the solution. And if we could come into that place, beloved, where we, where we understand, man, God has given us authority. God has called us. God saved us and established us as his ecclesia. So that we could release heaven on earth. It changes everything. I don't want to just tell you what we are, but I want to give you some practicals according to scripture. Uh, according to, to what the word of God has said and, and what is taught of how we are to be the church. And it starts with faith. Being the church will require us to believe in God, to trust in God, to be planted in him. I was, I was talking to the Lord this week, and he, he, he rebuked me a little bit because I was talking about finances. And I was like, God, 
man, um, I want to live in abundance. I was like, you know, I, you have provided every need on time. You have provided everything I needed, but I want to live in abundance. Like, like you, I, I, I've never lacked money, but I've never had this overflow of money, of finances in my bank account. And quickly but surely, I heard the Lord say, well, do you want to live out of the abundance of your bank account or out of my goodness? And, and I was like, ooh, because, because what God was showing me was, was man, there's a greater, uh, uh, there's greater availability for you. Like, do you, do you want your job to bless you or do you want me to bless you? Do you want to withdraw from your bank account or do you want to withdraw from heaven? And so in order to withdraw from heaven, you need faith. Faith is literally the currency of heaven. If you want something from heaven to be released on earth, you need faith. I'm going to read Matthew, I mean Mark 16. And it says, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I want to point out that as, 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 as Christians, as believers of Christ, as followers of Jesus, we don't follow signs. They follow us. When you live a lifestyle of trusting Jesus, of trusting God in your life, supernatural signs follow you. When you choose to live a lifestyle that I trust God for this and this and this in every area, signs automatically are assigned to your life. It says, in my name they will cast out demons. Understand that when I trust that God said through Jesus that, that hell will not prevail against the church, that lets me know that I have authority over the demonic. I have authority over what oppresses people. And so when I see it in my brothers or in my sisters or someone that the Lord brings to me, I know that I have authority to cast that baby out. I know that I have the authority to tell that thing to leave, to oppression to leave, fear to leave. They will speak with new tongues. This isn't just talking about your, 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 your heavenly tongues. This is talking, tongues means language. And what language means is communication. And this is, this is a word, right, because we are in a generation that needs new tongues. We are in a generation that needs new communication skills so that we can reach the masses like never before. We need to tap into the technology of heaven so that souls could be saved. They will take up serpents. You know, if you're going to be the light, you're going to be around a lot of snakes. If, 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 if you're going to be Jesus, you're constantly going to be surrounded by those who, who, who are quick and, and, and witty and, and look for your destruction. But you'll be able to pick them up. You'll be, you'll, be, you'll be able to remove them from their place of influence, from their comfort. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. This is what I'm talking about. We live in a life, in a culture where fear governs us. But, but Jesus is literally saying, he's like, look, even if you drink something deadly, it won't hurt you. Even if, if the attack does come to your life, it won't end you. Even if you are around serpents, it's, it's not going to destroy you. I love that, that, that Jesus understood that we would be attacked, but then brings a word to comfort us and says, hey, I'm going to still take care of you even if, even if that attack is, is, is for you. It will by no means hurt them, and they will lay hands on the sick and recover. Church, statistically, if you never pray for healing, statistically, you will never see it. But when you decide that your faith is in Jesus, the healer, the restorer, the redeemer, that by his stripes, by his torture, we are healed, then you could tell sickness to leave. But unless you go, unless you purpose in your heart to say, hey, I see brokenness and there's not brokenness in heaven. So I'm going to confront this. I'm going to confront this infirmity and I'm going to lay my hands on it and it has to go. 
when we become, when we acknowledge the authority God has given us, signs follow. The next thing that the church could do and be and is called to is holiness. Holiness is a dangerous word to the enemy and to the flesh. Holiness is a powerful word. It's an often misconstrued word because many people think that to be holy, you have to do it on your own strength. Jesus said, be holy as I am holy. And we think that it is out of our flesh, out of our strength that we are to be like Jesus. Holy means separate. Separated. But understand, when Jesus said, be holy because as I am holy, it wasn't be holy in your own strength, but be holy being found in me. Because when you're found in my identity, you won't want to live out of the, the, the standard of the earth. Being holy is a call to not be in fear. Because you can't be on Jesus' side and have fear inside of you. You can't be on Jesus' side and have worry inside of you. You can't be effective in the kingdom worried. It says, pray about everything, worry about nothing. But he says in Philippians 2.14, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Ooh. So that you may become blameless and pure. Ooh. Children of God, without fault in warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. What is it saying? It's saying, church, we can't continue to talk like the world talks. We can't continue to think like the world thinks. We can't have mannerisms like the world has mannerisms. Because when we choose, right, and this isn't out of, out of me showing how, how good I am, but this is just living a life that Jesus called me to live. But in it, when I choose to live a life that Jesus calls me to live, I will shine. You know what the purpose of a star shining is for? It illuminates darkness. Well, you know the purpose of a star is for? Is it brings direction. And, and if we're going to lead the, the world into the light, we got to be holy. The next thing we have is we have gifts. Oh, I love the Holy Spirit. I've been getting wrecked by the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, let me read 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It says, but the manifestation, the expression of the Holy Spirit is given to each one for profit of all. You listening, if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. You have been given the Holy Spirit in your life. And everyone who has the Holy Spirit has at least one gift or one expression of him that's supernatural. At when the church decides to come together, we will come together with every different gift. And it's going to work together. The church becomes so powerful when unity comes because while I may be good at something, my brother's good at something else, my other brother's good at something else, my sister's good here. But when, when, when there's this unity, it's like we're handicapped. The church is not called to be handicapped. We're supposed to have an answer for everything. But it only happens when all of us are together. There's many gifts. There, 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 there's the prophetic gift. You, 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 we often get caught off guard. But God is never caught off guard. And, and it's not a secret. It, I love the scripture says that, that Jesus, that God does nothing on earth without revealing it first. You know how to become a proactive church? To not be a reactive, not just dealing with, with the struggles that, that happen that are trending on Twitter, but to be a, a, a people group that see into the future and address that situation before it manifests. You need the gifts. You need the Holy Spirit. And there's many, many gifts. I know you're like, well, I, you know, I don't have those. I don't have those. There's a gift of generosity. Did you know that? It's a good gift. It's a great gift. You know why generosity is a great gift to me? Because what a gift is is a manifestation of God's spirit which means that he provides for it. He sustains it. So when I have a gift of generosity, it means that I could give, but God has to supply my giving. That's for somebody. Discover it. What is your gift? What has the Holy Spirit, what it does the Holy Spirit want to do through your life? Discover it. You can go to 1 Corinthians 12. There's a list there. You go to Ephesians. You can go to Romans. There's a list there of gifts. First Peter, 
Discover it, use it, develop it. Pair it with others. I love when, when we're in church and ministry time is coming on and, and, and like someone starts giving a word of knowledge. I love it because as soon as they start giving a word of knowledge, then I start getting a word of knowledge. Then someone else starts prophesying. And, and then, oh, now, now I, I, I sense something in my body and now the healing starts manifesting. And that's how it pairs. And that's how God gets the glory. Another way the, the, the Lord has called the church to be, which I think is one of the most important ones, is love is love. If we are to be the establishment of the government of heaven on earth, then love has to be the reason we do anything. When, 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 when we understand who, that we are the church, that we represent Jesus, we have to know why we represent him. We have to know, know what his, his prerogative, what his agenda, what his will is in order to, to, to properly live out the life or the assignment that he has given us. And it starts with, with, with John 3.16, right? God so loved the world that he sent his son. And what that tells me is that love is not a feeling or emotion or even a saying, but it's an expression of action. It's an expression of sacrifice. And if we are going to represent Jesus well, then we have to love well. Beloved. In 1 John 4, 7, it says, let us love one another for the love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. The most important function of the church is to love. 1 Corinthians 13 goes, goes into the description of what love is. And love is not an emotion. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. If you have, have put someone down because of the name of Jesus, that wasn't love. It is not self-seeking. If you have used the agenda of your Christianity to benefit your life, that is not love. It is not easily angered. If you get angry because people are doing things that you don't find correct, that's not love. It keeps no record of wrong. If you have a long list of what people have done to you, you're not living in love. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, and always hopes, always perseveres. The church needs a revelation of love. And if we need a revelation of love, we need a greater revelation of Jesus. Beloved, we are the church. We are what God has chosen to use to reveal himself. And we have options as the church. We have an option to hear the call and to know the purpose and live from that place or stay seated. And just listen to sermons, listen to worship, and never be active in our faith. But a time is here and has come where the church is, is rising up, where revival is going to hit the streets, where we're no longer going to be a light just in a building, but we're going to be a light in the news. We're going to be a light in the streets. We're going to be a light in politics. We're going to be a light in technology. We are going to bring people back to God. We are going to preach this gospel that saves, that, that, that says that, that Jesus came to die for our sins, though, that we can have a relationship with the Father. So that we wouldn't be, be victimized of, of the devil's schemes to steal, kill, and destroy. But no, that we would have an embrace of a, of a living God. This is the time to rise up. This is the time to put your pride, to put false identity, to put the voice of the enemy to the side and say, God, send me, use me. I know right now we're not meeting together, but that doesn't mean we're not unified. So I end with this. It's time to get a revelation of Jesus. It's time to come together. It's time to act. It's time to be the indestructible church. To be his hands, to be his feet, to be his mouthpiece. So I just want to pray to end this. 
Father, I thank you. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that you have given us access and authority to realms that the world doesn't know or understand. I thank you, Lord, that you have chosen us, you have chosen your church, you have chosen this generation to illuminate your truth, your son. I pray, Father, that we would wake up with the revelation that we are called to, to influence, we're called to, to bind and to loose, to release your goodness on earth. I pray for a revelation of your love that transcends my understanding and my trauma and any stronghold the enemy has built. We thank you, Abba. Use us. Raise us up. Amen. Hallelujah. Good word, brother. Powerful word. Let me ask you a question. What do you say to the man or to the woman that's listening who isn't in the church, isn't in Christ, isn't a believer in Messiah Jesus, and they have not been born again. What do you say to that person? Because there are people watching, and it's like, man, I grew up being, being told that the church is a building, and religion is man's attempt to pursue God, and, but I don't know him. I don't know him. And what you're communicating to me is, is a new message what do you say to that person? How do they get into the place to experience what God is building? Yeah. I will tell them, I've been there. Mm. I've done that, and I've experienced it. And the revelation of God's love met me one day, and I was never the same. And it, it, all it took was a decision for me to say, I choose to leave the old person. Mm. I choose to leave my old lifestyle mm. so that I could experience what you have promised me what you have decided to bless me with. Mm -hmm. It's a confession. It's a powerful one. Mm -hmm. It's a declaration right. that Jesus, you are God, you are living, and you do love me. Mm -hmm. And you have the power to sustain me and keep me. Mm -hmm. And you will never be the same. This is a perfect time to say yes to him. Because with, when he comes, he comes with peace. Yes. And he comes with joy. And he comes with, with a covenant, with a relationship. He loves you. He chose you. He called you. Amen. Amen. It's powerful. The church looks like Jesus. We're his body. It's an excellent word. Thanks for inspiring us and challenging us and speaking to our heart, brother. I love you. Thank you. Amen. How y'all doing? It's another day. Apparently, Montgomery County is going to go into phase two this coming week. Uh, I'm not sure what that's going to look like and what that is going to translate into in regards to gathering again. Times Square Church uh, up in New York City, the pastor said, we're not going to meet together until we all can be together. So they're going a little further and persevering and doing what we're doing here. And that's kind of how I feel. I miss you. We need each other, especially in this season with what's going on in our nation. We need to be together. I ask that you'd open your heart to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Allow him to, to show you anything inside of you that, that doesn't belong, that isn't like Jesus. Any history that's still governing you, any, any pain that's still controlling your heart, I want to encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit now in, into those areas of brokenness and allow Him to heal you, allow Him to minister to you. And I'm very serious about this series. I know in the grace of God that the Lord is going to provide an open door for us to talk about racism and to be real and to really address um, the problem. And the church should look different than the world. And there should be no racism and segregation and rejection and uh, a superior mindset over one culture, over one, one people group. No, no, we need to break that thinking and, and confront it in Jesus' name. So I aim to do that. Also, lastly, um, I know a number of you are out of work and there hasn't been an income coming to you. Hopefully, in the grace of God, that that's going to change very soon. I want to thank King of the Nations. I'm so proud of this church. 
for just being faithful and honoring uh, the offering and, and giving out of, out of really the grace of God and out of love for this body. And so I just want to encourage you to continue to do that. Amen. May the Lord richly bless you this week. May the power of God be upon your life. And may everything that Carlos shared today, may it be activated by the Holy Spirit in King of the Nations. And may we go to a new level of touching the nations in this region. Amen. And remember, if you're in that turbulence, it's time to get out of it. It's time to enter into your peace the peace of the Lord into the rest that the Father has provided for you and allow the Holy Spirit now to just escort you out of that cloud. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for my brothers and sisters and especially anyone that's in a cloud of turbulence made up of fear and anger and confusion and and pain. I pray, Father, that you would take them out of that cloud and bring them into a higher place, a place of your glory place of your presence, place of your peace and rest, a place of your power. Bring them into that place now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll see you Wednesday night. Start reading Matthew. Amen.